I talk a lot about the classics and how great they are and how much I love them and how much I was inspired by them. But what on earth do I even mean by the classics? Hey y'all, welcome back to the Lavender Book Company. I'm Kat and I'm a children's book author and illustrator, but I'm very inspired by the classics. So I'm very passionate about bringing classic feeling books to the modern kid. So that's kind of my whole shtick, if you want to say. <laughs> so over on Instagram, I received this message about really what do I even mean by the classics? And I thought this was a really good question. So something I kind of just like assumed that everybody just knew what I was thinking and knew what I meant by this. And so I did answer her question in that comment and I'll kind of just pop it up here so you guys can see what I responded with. But I kind of wanted to dive a little bit deeper into what really do I mean by when I'm saying the classics. So first, before we jump into it, if you guys wouldn't mind giving a like on this video, it really appeases the algorithm God and it makes them very happy. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, I'd appreciate it. And also, if you'd like to stick around and see how I make my children's books, talking about children's books and kind of growing my whole small publishing company, then definitely stick around, subscribe. I'd love to have you around. So let's go ahead and just jump right into this. So I do think that there are five main things that kind of determine whether or not something's going to be a classic. So definitely stick around. I'm going to be sharing kind of some older books that I think constitute as a classic, but also I'm going to include some modern books that I could see becoming classics down the line. Um, because I think kind of part with being a classic is it kind of has to withstand the test of time, but we'll get there. We'll get there one thing at a time. Okay. By the way, I didn't even mention, I finally have my new background. Hope you guys enjoy it. If you guys want to see how I put this whole background together, it was just in my very most recent video. So it was really fun. I really liked putting this one together. It's not as much of an eyesore as before. So yay. <laughs> of course, I do want to put a disclaimer on this video because a lot of the times these types of things also come down to personal taste as well, where you might think that there's something that's a classic and it's not my personal favorite. Um, there are some books that I do deem a classic, but I don't really enjoy them. Like Harold and the Purple Crayon. I know people are going to come for me in the comments on that, but I just cannot stand that book. <laughs> I just cannot stand it. I I think it was very lacking. I think there could have been more to it, but I do understand the, the significance that it has and it holds a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. I think the idea was really creative. I think the illustrations are really cute, um, but I do think it was kind of lacking. So, but I do understand where it kind of stands with people and I do kind of look at it as a classic book. So just know that going into this, I might suggest some books that you may not like and that's totally fine and vice versa. So let's just know that. So let's go to what, what, let's first define what I mean by classic. So when I say something's classic, what do we really mean? We mean something that's timeless, something that's very recognizable. It's kind of withstood the test of time. It's very well illustrated. And this can be in many different types of styles. It doesn't have to be one specific type of style, but it's very well illustrated. A lot of thought went into the illustrations and it's also very well written. Okay. So let's dive into the five things I think that make a classic, a classic universal themes. So I think there's a reason why certain books just really withstand the test of time because it talks about a lot of topics and themes that really anyone from any generation can kind of relate to on some sense. And there's a lot of power there by being able to relate to many different people from many different walks of life, from many different time periods. There's a lot of power there. And most of the time, but not always, is there kind of a bigger message underneath the story that doesn't always happen with classics. But I think a lot of the times it helps kind of just give more to the story and it gives a lot more nostalgia for the story as well. And with these themes, there's just stories that like really any child can relate to, like being mischievous like Peter Rabbit or being very curious like Curious George, you know, things like that, or going through really hard times like Wilbur. You know, these are all stories that kids can relate to on some level because they've all had to experience it or will experience it in some way. The next topic I want to talk about is lovable characters. Why do we love characters like Wilbur and Charlie and Corduroy so much? So for children, the characters really do represent a lot for them. And so I think when you have a character that a lot of children can connect to on some level or find very lovable in some way or has some really cute characteristics about the character, a lot of children are going to latch onto that character and just absolutely love it. But I think the big thing about these characters is that they're realistic. They're not perfect people. They're not perfect 
creatures or characters, they have their own faults, but it's going through those challenges and working through their faults. That's where you find the lovable characters. And that's why kids love them. It's exactly why as adults, we love realistic characters too. We don't want to read a book where they just automatically solve everything, automatically figure everything out. They're the best person for everything because it's not realistic. And as much fun as sometimes it is to kind of see these people who are just awesome at everything, Ultimately, we latch onto characters that kind of overcome this big trial. They have like a redemption arc or things like that. So we always love an underdog. That's just who we are as people. We love rooting for those characters, even at a very young age. All right, so number three is impactful. So these stories have to be impactful. It's one thing to tell just a really sweet story. It's another thing to totally transport a child into another world. And I think that's why people do love Beatrix Potter so much. And I know I mention her all the time, but she's like my muse okay <laughs> that's something that people just love about beatrix potter she was able to transport children into a totally different world and i think that's what really sold it like that's what really made it so wonderful was because i just don't know if anything had been done like that before where it wasn't just one character with one story it was interwoven storylines with interwoven characters creating this whole other magical place for kids to go like with these stories and with these this impact it makes such an impact where then those children grow up and become parents themselves and then because of the nostalgia that they feel and from the stories and the memories that they hold with these books then they buy the books for their kids as well and then the cycle pretty much continues on okay y'all know how much i love this Y'all know how much I care about this because I talk about it all the time, but illustrations. I am so big on illustrations. I think sometimes they, especially nowadays, I feel like they're kind of getting pushed to the back burner. And to me, I find that really sad because illustrations are such a great way to storytell and they cannot be the afterthought. I put so much time and energy into all my illustrations. I'm very specific on like what materials I use, what colors I'm using, the overall feel, size, perspective, all of that stuff plays into the storytelling process. And so I know for some illustrators, it may not be very specific. They kind of have a style and they kind of stick to it and that's totally fine. Um, but for me, I think all of it kind of plays in with the storytelling process. And so for me, all of my illustrations are very purposeful especially because I look at illustrations as like just little pieces of art. So for me, they're not an afterthought. They're, I really put so much time and energy into all of mine because I know the part that they play. And something too with picture books that I think sometimes people forget is a lot of the times if kids can't read yet, they'll pull books off the shelf and just look through them themselves. And so that's also why I love illustrations because it can help tell a story to a child who can't read yet because they're kind of just seeing the pictures and then coming up with a story in their head. They're kind of piecing everything together that way because we have to remember that great writing cannot save bad illustrations and great illustrations cannot save bad writing when it comes to children's books. They both need each other. They're both equally as important. And so the same amount of energy has to be put on both. And I especially look at the classics. There's a lot of truth there with classic books that we love. I mean, there's a variety of illustration styles, so you can't really say that it has to be one type of style. And I think that would also be very limiting as well, especially to children. But you can tell with the classics, a lot of thought went into them. I think that's the biggest thing is you can tell a lot of energy and thought went into them. And it just, it speaks volumes and it helps boost and elevate the storyline. Last one, of course, I have to talk about the writing because y'all know I'm big on the writing too. I hate, hate <laughs> when, when people talk down to kids. I cannot stand it. <laughs> it is my pet peeve. Children are not dumb. And I think that's something that people really love about the classic writing is because Authors back then knew how to simplify for children, but never to dumb down for children because there is a huge difference where I think today we've gotten a little bit because we've gotten lazy in our speech. OK, come on, let's let's just be honest with each other for a second. OK, we've gotten way lazier in our speech. And I think in turn, we've looked at kids and we have thought that they they need something really oversimplified and just kind of more at a, at a child's level of of speaking when in reality we should always be trying to stretch our child's vocabulary so that's even why in my book my book is kind of geared towards ages three to seven give or take 
I read it to my son when he was about two and a half and he was just fine with it. I mean, we read a lot, so he's just, I think he's just used to it. But even in that book, I didn't shy away from using like bigger words for kids of that level because that's the only way that we learn new things is when we stretch ourselves. And so there's a difference between simplifying things down and then dumbing them down. And I think that also plays into what makes a classic a classic because it is not easy to tell a story in a limited amount of words while also appealing to two different demographics at the same time. It's not easy. I think people look at it and they think that writing a children's book is very easy. It is not easy. <laughs> I especially think that shorter books the shorter books you have are even harder. Um, and of course, you're also having to look at the age demographic as well to make sure that it's age appropriate and the level you have is still age appropriate. You want it to be so they can understand it, but you want it to be a little bit stretching of their vocabulary, but not too far gone, you know? So it's a, definitely a balancing game. That's something that the classics have kind of nailed is they've nailed this balance between all of it. And that's something that I think appeals to both kids and parents. To kind of bounce off my last point, I think when we talk about children's classics, we're talking about books that have kind of nailed all of these points. They have the lovable characters, they have these great universal themes, wonderful writing, beautiful illustrations. And I, I'm also talking about like little chapter books as well. So I'm not talking about just picture books here because when it comes to children's classics, this also stretches beyond just picture books, obviously, because there's classics in every genre of literature. Now there does come a time where some of these classics, I feel like they miss on <laughs> one or two of these points, <coughs> Harold, <coughs> but we can still acknowledge them for being classics and for what they are and for the nostalgia that they hold for people, because ultimately there's nothing wrong with these more sillier books. And I talk about that all the time. Um, but specifically today I'm talking about classics. So that's why I'm like, but I just, I just love this guy. Now, some books that I would consider classics besides my normal favorites of like Peter Rabbit and Velveteen Rabbit and, you know, those kinds of books, um, as much as I love them, I won't mention them again, but <laughs> so some books that I would consider classic and I think other people would consider classic. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many. I feel like I could do a whole nother video on just books. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to do that. I've done a video before where I kind of recommend some books that should be in the at home library, but I think I'm going to do some classic books. I think that every child should have, because I think that's a really good list, especially for parents. If you're kind of lost on where to start, like where to even go with all of this stuff. So that will be coming out shortly. But some books that I would consider classic would be like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Little House on the Prairie, Stuart Little, books like that. When it comes to picture books, books like Winnie the Pooh, Where the Wild Things Are, Corduroy, things like that. Now, some more modern books that I think that will become classics later is Oh, The Things You Will Be. I think this book is so, I just love Emily Winfield Martin for so many reasons. I love not only her writing, I think her writing is very creative, but I love her illustrations. I am absolutely in love with her illustrations. It, they're just so dreamy. I just, ugh. Oh, I just love her. So I can definitely see, and I think the, oh, the, oh, the things you will be, I think made such an impact, especially when it was released. And I think it's just such a sweet book overall. It has a sweet message. So I definitely see that one going into the classics category as time goes on. And then I'll also put up some other books here as well that I think are more modern, but they will also kind of make it into the classics category as time goes on because I just absolutely love them and adore them so much. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. I, I just love talking about children's books. I think, I think they are so important for so many different reasons and I just absolutely adore them. I, I just love them. I love the memories that I hold with them. And so let me know your thoughts down below. If you'd like to talk more about children's books and kind of see my creative process as well, definitely subscribe. I'd love to have you around. Hit the like button if you haven't already and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.